It's one of the biggest controversies confronting us today. The implications of this controversy impact scientists, impact medical doctors working in the clinical setting, it impacts our culture and society at large. It even has legal ramifications. And that question is, what is a human embryo? And does the human embryo have value? Welcome to this latest episode of Testable Faith. My name is Fuzz Rana. I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe, which sponsors this program. And I'm joined in studio today by Dr. Christina Cerucci, who's going to help us address this controversy. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for being here with us again. Well, thanks so much for having me, Fuzz. It's great to be here. Now, I'm really interested in your perspective on the, the whole question of how do we understand what a human embryo is? Because your training in medicine is in, in OBGYN. Your, yes. your specialization is obstetrics and gynecology. So. The first question is then, is the human embryo valuable? What kind of value does it have? Ah, uh, that is, as you said earlier, that's just such a big question now. I, I believe the embryo is valuable because I believe um, that life begins at conception. So right. now some people will say, well, that's your religious belief, but it's, it's really a scientific belief. At conception, at fertilization, that one-celled organism has his or her own unique DNA. It, uh, at conception, that organism is a human. That organism is living. Yeah. Um, so I believe that, that, that the embryo is valuable because the embryo is a human being. Yeah, it's, I always found it odd that, you know, some people would argue, look, all the embryo is just a clump of cells, right? That it's nothing more than that. And I just, anybody that has had even a slight exposure to embryology, I think we'd be hard pressed to say that an embryo is just a clump of human cells. I would agree. If, I mean, it's a clump of cells as much as you or I are a clump of cells. It's a pretty well designed clump of cells. So yeah. I would agree with you there. Well, and, and it's a, a collection of cells that uniquely possess a capacity to undergo a very elaborate process of growth and development. Right? There, right, you can take a handful of skin cells or even a handful of cells from different, you know, different parts of our body and put them together, you know, in culture, and they're not going to function right. uh, like an and like an embryo functions. Right. So, um, um, if science then basically says, look. Um, Th this th this embryo really is indeed a distinct human person that's unique. Right. Uh, how on earth could anybody then justify acts like abortion or even things like embryonic stem cell research? Great question. And uh, yeah, if we could only answer that. But I would say there are several reasons that I see um, that people would justify abortion. I think one reason is is perhaps that they ignore the science or maybe are not aware of the science or yeah. don't want to look at the science. Um, because if you don't believe the embryo is a human being, then abortion sure. would be okay. And it really all, people use a lot of reasons why to justify abortion, but it really all comes down to that one question. If this is a human being, then, um, abortion is wrong. I think the other reason would be, you know, you often hear women say, my body, my choice. So it's the idea of women, of, of autonomy, a woman's autonomy. Right. Um, and we do have autonomy. Uh, you know, if a doctor prescribes me pills, I can choose not to take them, even though it's mm -hmm. recommended. But the issue with abortion is this is now, we're talking about another, if we're talking about another human being, which you and I believe right. we are, then that trumps the autonomy of a, of a woman that is no longer her body. She doesn't have autonomy over another body. Right. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that I see happening, and I, and I think, again, this is the impact of, of science on the, the, the pro-life, pro-choice debate, is that 
more and more people that advocate for a, a, a pro-choice position would agree that indeed, you know, the human embryo is a person. And again, the science, when you, when you do accept the, the, the science, right. I think you really are forced into that position. But they argue that even though it's a human being, it's not a human person. Right. So speak about that a little bit. Right. And I think you're right. So there has become a distinction. Uh, I, I think earlier it was, oh, it's a clump of cells. And now it's more like, okay, it's a human being, but not a person. Well, when does personhood begin? So what is the difference between an embryo at any stage of development, whether one cell or on through that development, what is the difference between that human being and a toddler? Well, one difference is size. Well, just because someone, a, a six month old is smaller than a 10 month old, we would never say it's okay to kill the six month old. What is another difference? Level of development, we would never say because a six month old is not as developed as an adult, it's okay to just kill a six month old. Uh, level of dependency, well, we're all dependent mm -hmm. on someone. Certainly, yes, an embryo is more dependent in a sense than, than a two year old, but a two year old is still dependent. Mm -hmm. You and I are still dependent on other people. Um, so, and, and then environment. So the embryo or the fetus is in the womb and a six month old or a toddler is outside. Does that give us the right to, right. to, so I would also say we, there's in the whole process of embryological and fetal development, there's no magic moment that all of a sudden personhood is infused. So yeah. I would argue that personhood begins at conception. Yeah, you know, and t to some degree, it seems to me like this this concept of personhood might even be somewhat arbitrary, right? Right. I'm, I'm not even sure I know how you would define personhood, right? Right. Or who gets to define personhood if you can right. define it, you know, in a in a clear, you know, compelling way. And as you said, it, it's it's rather arbitrary. And you know, I know that that Peter Singer, for example, who's an, an atheist, right, uh, ha has argued that. Um, as part of his system of ethics, where you want to minimize pain and suffering mm -hmm. for sentient beings. Right. And so he would argue that uh, that actually infanticide should be allowed up to two years of age because infants don't have sentience or they don't have self-awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that actually a greater moral value should be attributed to, you know, let's say a, a humpback whale mm -hmm. than should be attributed to a two-year-old uh, or younger right. human infant. But, but again, it seems to me like this concept of sentience um, is, is ill-defined. How do you define it? How do you determine who has sentience or what is, what is a, the right amount of sentience to have? Right. So what is your thought about that as a, a criteria? Sure. Well, I actually, you know, I don't agree with Peter Singer, but I have some respect because I think there's sort of a honesty in that he, like we said, you know, if it's okay to kill a baby in the womb, why, why is it not okay to kill a toddler? So there's sort of a more consistency in his argument. I certainly don't agree with it, but right. um, the problem, you know, we come to is then, like you said, where do we determine this? Does a, a disabled person or an older person or a younger person or, I mean, this is a slippery slope also. And um, I think we have to see humans, every human being is made in the image of God. It's not our ability to perform that determines our value. It's our creator that has determined our value. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, in a, you know, this may be getting a bit off topic here, but, but again, you, you, you raise a very important point that at least in the Christian worldview, there's a very clear understanding of the, the, the fact that each human life is sacred, that there's infinite worth and value. Right. When you move away 
from a, at least broadly speaking, a theistic worldview to a, a materialistic or a naturalistic worldview, ultimately, it seems like the, the value that you ascribe to a human being is really arbitrary. It's, it's convenient, what is convenient, right. what is culturally deemed acceptable. So there is no inherent worth or value in right. a human being. And you, I think you see this played out you know, when it comes to this pro-life, pro-choice debate. Right. Yes. And I think there's also, you know, there's some other arguments that, like when you look at um, laws that are passed, they, like Roe v. Wade, they looked at viability and they said, well, viability, you know, at that time it was probably 28 weeks. When I finished residency, it was 24 weeks when a baby can live outside the womb and now it's at 22 weeks so that's an arbitrary uh, cutoff so to speak and uh, I don't see that as a justification and then there was you know in some legal arguments about oh well a baby that young can't feel pain and this is an interesting thing there was a um, Stuart Derbyshire published an article a couple decades ago saying that well you don't have the cortex developed till around 26 weeks, so there's no way a baby can feel pain until then. Now, Stuart Derbyshire is not pro-life, but um, a few years ago, he and another person published another article, I believe it was called Rethinking Fetal Pain, where they said, actually, there's thalamic projections as, you know, earlier on, and it's possible the baby feels pain as early as 12 weeks. And I think that just demonstrates that we don't, there's a lot we don't know, right? And um, I go back to when is this? Is this a human right. being? And yes, it it is a, from conception. Yeah. Well, you know, and it seems to me that again, any time you try to <laughs> to to come up with some kind of criteria, you know, for when is this? When is the fetus a a quote yes. unquote person? It always feels again a bit arbitrary. I always ask the question, why do you get to decide? Right. You know, why is pain necessarily right. The, the right criteria? Right. You know, but even then, if you, you grant that, okay, this is an acceptable criteria, it seems like the science keeps pushing back, right. the, you know, the, 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 the point of personhood closer and closer to the time of conception. You know, and when it comes to viability, you know, there's some interesting work that's happening with artificial womb technology, right. right, you know, where you know people have have created these kind of bioreactors where they've shown by putting you know sheep fetuses in these bioreactors that they can actually carry them to full term, right. and they appear to be healthy. Mm -hmm. It's not optimal, but if you have a situation where a child's born prematurely, putting a child in an artificial womb could very well push viability back even right. earlier than 20 weeks, mm -hmm. right? And so it seems like the science and the technology really undermine any criteria that people would reasonably bring to the table uh, to try to establish personhood. I would agree, yes. That's what I'm saying. We, 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 use these, we have used the scientific criteria, but then as science advances, we have to move that back. And, and so I don't think we can say, okay, at this point, at 20 weeks or 24 weeks, or this is a person, I think this is a person from the be very beginning. Yeah, yeah. All right, a anything else, Chris? No, thanks so much. This was great talking to you today, Fuzz. Yeah, thanks again for being here. Uh, thanks for, so much for watching this episode of Testable Faith. Uh, I would encourage you to go to our website, reasons.org, search for Chris Cerucci, and you should be able to gain access to all the resources that she's produced for us here at Reasons to Believe. And until next time, remember the more that we learn about science, the more we have reasons to believe.